and sisters stand up and fight spread what do more than is out there freely more freely more so he turn a flame he ends up with the flame oh oh boom 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 Mozambique, a luta continua, a luta continua, continua. In Zimbabwe, a luta continua, a luta continua, continua. In Mami, a luta continua, a luta continua, continua. In Zambia, I don't continue. I don't continue. I continue. I don't continue. I don't continue. I don't continue. Aluta, 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 aluta. Thank you, Sompisi. Uh, I've been listening to that song uh, the whole week. Um, oh, tabak, tabak. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've also been, uh, you know, hearing myself and preparing myself with that song. Mm, mm, so thank you mm. so much for that energy. Greetings again to everyone. Um, I welcome everyone who has joined us. Um, we are also streaming on Facebook. So thank you to everyone who is streaming from there. We, we want to appreciate you. We want to be grateful um, for this platform, for this opportunity. For joining us, for taking our time on a Friday uh, evening. Zinini Gizim, that can be done on a Friday evening. Uh, mm -hmm. But we appreciate that you have uh, taken a decision to join us on this platform. As mm -hmm. we reflect on uh, the revolutionary from Mozambique today, uh, a while ago, we were talking about Thomas Sankara. And yeah. today we will be talking about um, uh, Usamora Moses Marshall. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting for me uh, to note that these two were actually friends. Yes. Um, um, you know, they were, they were so in sync in revolutionary thought and ways that they shared similar views about some social political issues um, as well. You know, for example, Samora Marshall once said about women, and I quote, the emancipation of women is not an act of charity the result of a humanitarian or compassionate attitude. The liberation of women is a fundamental necessity for the revolution, a guarantee of its continuity and a precondition for its victory. Those words were uttered by Osama Ramoshel in a speech he gave in 1973. Now listen to what, um, listen to what um, once said. Uh, I just want to show you just how aligned, how in sync they were. Thomas Sankara once said, and I quote, the revolution and uh, women's liberation go together. We do not talk of women's emancipation as an act of charity or out of a surge of human compassion. It is a basic necessity for the revolution to triumph. Uh, so through this, we see that Sankara and Marshall, you know, were, were literally cut from the same cloth. And I think already we should, uh, we should reflect on this, uh, Uguti, what kind of friends are we keeping? And are they propelling our vision, our drive, or are they a hindrance to it? 
are our friends enhancing our vision or are they a stumbling block? Um, you know, it doesn't help family to, to keep a company that doesn't accentuate our aspirations and, and, and make us better people and want to, to, to continue with this fight. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are stalling and are not in the, in the interest or in the business of pushing uh, the African agenda. So we also need to be careful of the kind of friends that, that we keep, the kind of company that we keep. Uh, in actual fact, we should think of a diet, not only as the food we eat, but also as uh, the kind of company that we keep and the kind of things that we watch, the kind of things that we listen to, the kind of things that we expose ourselves to. Uh, so I just thought it's interesting that um, U -u 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 Thomas Sankara that we were paying homage to just a week ago uh, was very close friends to the leader and revolutionary that we are going to talk about today, Osamora Moses Marshall. But family, before I continue, uh, before I commence with our lecture tonight, I would actually like us to take a moment uh, and pay our respects to our brothers and sisters um, that have lost their lives in Nigeria. You may all be aware of um, what is happening there. Uh, there's a campaign called uh, NSARS, which is a decentralized social movement against police brutality in Nigeria. And this slogan calls for the end of what is known as a special anti-robbery squad, which is a, a controversial unit of the Nigerian police with a long record of abuses. Um, the initial demand moved into requests for change generally and the end of corruption, better infrastructure and living conditions. Uh, there was peaceful protesting uh, that united Nigerians across all spectrum, uh, which was suddenly hijacked by organized gangs paid by the authorities. And a curfew was actually issued uh, and some people refused to leave uh, in Lagos uh, and a major railing point, Lake Tollgate, uh, was set upon by military officers who then killed innocent protesters. Uh, family, this, this trend, this brutality, we also see or we also saw uh, in America with the killing of Floyd and, and of course many others alike. And I want to state that this is, is not an attack on Nigeria. It is an attack on black people. Uh, it is an attack on us. What happens in Nigeria is happening to us because we are indeed uh, one. And so in coalition with the Evoke family and brother Ikele, uh, Fred Martins, who is from Nigeria, um, the Arise Black Child stands in solidarity uh, to echo for the end of police brutality that is going on in Nigeria. You know, we were actually talking to Brother Ikele yesterday evening, who is, who is in Nigeria. And uh, he was telling us of just how dire the situation is there at the moment. And uh, he was also alerting us of, of how they've also blocked the sharing of messages uh, that have to do with this whole campaign on social media. You might have seen that uh, it's quite difficult to, 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 to share messages or visuals that have to do with this campaign going on. So our intention as Arise Black Child is to govern solidarity through weaving and leveraging Evoke Family Platforms, um, activist practices and works to raise consciousness and awareness of our collective power in community. We also want to educate and mobilize about the end uh, police brutality campaign. Uh, and our joint solidarity strategy will include, uh, we have a publication on Fridays called the Africa Friday Reflection. So one of the things that we will do is we will have a special Ikele um, evoke activist expression campaign edition that will speak to uh, what is going on there. And we will have a special feature, uh, Arise Evoke Zoom session uh, before or after uh, that publication. So please be on the lookout uh, for more information regarding that. 
And then um, I'm also pleased to, to announce that U, U Brother Veli Mpele, whom I'm very much honored to share tonight's lecture with, uh, the same way we did with Utuma Sankara, uh, is, is also going to spend a great deal of his time uh, highlighting uh, on, on the issues that are happening at, in Nigeria. Um, can I just please ask that we all ensure, uh, Uguti, we have our mics uh, switched off at all times. Uh, so I will, I will then commence uh, with, with my lecture. Uh, thank you to everyone who just recently joined us. You are at the right place. We will be paying homage uh, to the revolutionary Mozambican uh, military commander and president, uh, Samora Machel. I've already started reflecting on his friendship with uh, Thomas Sankara and how interesting that these two revolutionary leaders were actually allies and uh, you know, spoke with one voice uh, as if they were literally cut from the same cloth. Can I just confirm uh, before I continue, it would be a tragedy uh, if, if no one can hear me and I'm, I'm speaking alone. Can I just get confirmation from one or two people that you can hear me and my connection is, is, is all good? Can hear you loud and clear. Loud and clear. Thank you so, so much for that confirmation. Um, so family, I actually yeah, want to start, um, I want to start my lecture with Samora Machel's quote, uh, one of his quotes, which will actually <coughs> act as a backdrop um, for my lecture. And um, the quote goes, and I quote, uh, the rich man's dog gets more in the way of vaccination, medicine, and medical care than do the workers upon whom the rich man's wealth is built. Um, and these were the words uttered by Usamora Machel. And these words will act as a backdrop of my lecture uh, as they reveal the cruelty of neocolonialism and reflect uh, you know, Africans' position in today's white dominated society. Um, I will begin with a very brief biography of Samara Machel. I'm going to ask that we all read up. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything. I'm just going to touch briefly on his biography. Then I want to get to, to the crux of, of my lecture. Uh, Samara Machel was born on the 29th of September uh, in 1933 in a village in the district of Gaza, south of Mozambique. He grew up in an agricultural village and attended uh, Mission Elementary School. He completed the fourth class, uh, which is a prerequisite for any higher education. Um, and Marshall's hopes for higher education were frustrated uh, by Catholic missionaries who refused to grant him a scholarship. Marshall then hoped uh, 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 to train as a nurse which is one of the few professions which had been opened to blacks. He worked as an aide in the hospital and this is where his revolutionary journey actually began. Um, family, there is not much that we can do when remembering a struggle icon such as Samora Machel than to make an attempt to go through uh, their extraordinary genius minds. We can talk about historic events and biographies, but if we do not explore the beautiful minds of our heroes and learn their ways, we will make very little progress. So let us explore the life of Samora Machel, not just as a historic account, but with the intention uh, to take from some of his powerful ideas and use them for ourselves. And the first thing that I want to talk about, the first lesson that I want to draw upon from Moses uh, Samora Machel is the righteous indignation. And I will explain what that means in a moment. So while, while uh, Samora Machel was working as a nurse in Mugwell Bombada Hospital, he discovered that white nurses were paid 
more than black nurses. Uh, and being greatly angered by this, he left Mozambique and went to Tanzania to join uh, Frelimo. The first lesson to learn here is, is that of anger. Um, I keep muting uh, people, but they unmute themselves. Please just uh, ensure that your, your, your mic is, is always muted. So not just, not just any kind of anger though, uh, family, uh, but a righteous indignation. Righteous indignation is defined as a reactive emotion of anger over mistreatment, insult, or malice of another. And until we are angry enough about injustice, we can never bring about change. It is my view that we are not angered. It is my view that if we are not angered by injustice, we ourselves uh, are unjust. Righteous indignation is not just about being angry, but it is a reactive force. It pushes one to do something about injustice and such is the heart that Samora Michelle had. And like Samora Michelle, we need to be angry men and women and channel our anger towards achieving liberation for ourselves and for generations to come. The injustices that um, we are not angry about are the ones we continue to tolerate and sometimes we tolerate them because we have been convinced that it is all our fault. And, and we're gonna talk about neocolonialism in a moment and you will see how uh, this, this tool, this strategy is used uh, to continue subjugate uh, black lives. There is no shame family in being angry about injustice and there is no shame in fighting. And it doesn't matter how you fight as long as your goal is to liberate you. Um, and so you are fighting for a just cause. And again, one of, one of the things that neocolonialism does is it wants, to, it wants to regulate how you deal with your anger. So white people will anger you, they'll provoke you. And when you stand up to, to, to become angry, they will tell you how uncivilized you are in your anger. Uh, but like I said, let me not jump the gun. We will talk about neocolonialism in a moment. Samara Michelle was a fighter, an angry fighter who led Frelimo's uh, guerrilla attacks on the Portuguese, but it all started from discovering an injustice in the land. You know, it, it, it always has to start somewhere. And most revolutionaries that I know uh, were, were, were unsettled with a certain injustice that they witnessed. And that is where the revolutionary journey begins for most of them. It takes a big heart for me to forsake your own job and take up arms and fight for your people. This caring and honest leadership demonstrated by Samora is a great example for us to follow. I want to talk family about um, another thing um, that we can learn from Osamara Michelle, and that is a lesson on decentralization. Uh, so we also need to understand the depth of the problems that colonialism has brought upon us and all its strategies. Samora Michelle was very quick to recognize what the capitalist system had done in the geographical centralization of services. This is a strategy used by colonial forces to develop only certain parts of our country so that whoever needs services is left with no choice but to relocate to where such services are. These developed areas are highly colonial in nature. They do not preserve the African culture and do not provide any African education and we, 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 we also see this happening today. Uh, it's every person's wish or Salah in a rural area or in the location to move into the suburbs and to study there, not only that, but to work there, to stay there. And so we see this centralization happening in certain areas when uh, the rural areas and the townships are left uh, underdeveloped. And, and, and this is a problem that we need to look into and resolve. What the system does, family, is empty Black communities of their capacity to develop 
by separating bright young minds from the experienced true Africans. And then it exploits young minds and feeds them all sorts of misguidance that will further drive them away from the African way of life. Not only so, but black communities are left without the necessary levels of energy to carry out any form of development since all young people are forced to move into cities in search of a better life. So no one gets left behind to develop uh, the rural areas and the townships because uh, it's everyone's dream and aspiration, Uti, I need to move out of here. And I think that is the mindset that we, we need to challenge. Uguti, even as you go to university to study whatever course, it must be studied with, with, with your people uh, at the back of your mind. You must have you know, the psychological disposition that I am going to be equipped, I am going to be trained, but it is so that I can come back and empower my people. But what we see happening is that people move far and far away from where they come from and they isolate themselves uh, from where they came from, leaving uh, they are, they are people underdeveloped or not developed because as soon as they were skilled enough, uh, they felt that they were better and they need to move away. And this has led to the lack of development in rural communities. For the sake of simplifying this, we should ask, who is driving development in the rural villages of Limpopo? Uh, of KZN, of Mpumalang, of Northwest, of all the, the places that you can think of. When all the young people uh, and all the educated people of those communities are in white cities seeking for communities. Samora Machel realized this and felt it needed to change. He said, and I quote, there are a lot of unemployed people here in Maputo and yet there are huge tracts of land in rural areas. We must take them there to work, unquote. Although some people saw this as an aggression against human rights, what they did not realize was that this was going to become a very powerful shift towards the liberation of all Mozambican communities and the Mozambican people. What this basically meant was that if you were an engineer working in Maputo, but coming from the rurals of Mavume, you had to go back and be an engineer in Mavume where you came from. This meant that services would have to, make, would have to be made available in Mavume. Uh, factories would have to be built. Mining was supposed to be on the rise. Farms, accounting firms, malls, and decent living residential areas were supposed to be built. What is also implied for the capitalist was that the market would have to be shared equally and fairly instead of having one supplier in a city where everyone is congested. New black suppliers would have to emerge from rural communities. Uh, the centralized capitalist economy would be crippled and a new economy that is based on rural development would have to emerge. At the heart of this powerful decentralization uh, is the idea of independence. Some to see Mozambicans self-sufficient and driving their own sustainable development. And, and I think for me, this is the true essence of freedom. This is the true essence of liberation. Surely when you want what is best for the people, you produce ideas that will lift them to a completely different level. Uh, independence is the ultimate goal. And if we carry on in the spirit of Samora Marshall, that is certainly where we are headed. And again, I can reference, I, I, I can see the similarities with Utoma Sankara, who was all about self-sustainance and he, he even cut off you know, aid, external aid, and made sure that the Burkinabe people could feed themselves. And I'm, I'm tempted to say that if we cannot yet feed ourselves, then we are not free uh, family. If we still rely on external uh, forces to feed us, then we are far from being free. Uh, I then want to move on to 
us understanding the whole concept of, of neocolonialism, I've really simplified it. And this is my version of neocolonialism. And then I will move on to how uh, Samora Machel addressed neocolonialism um, through a phrase that he coined, and we all know it, uh, aluta continua. So we will talk about that briefly. Um, one of the best ways of understanding neocolonialism, in my view, is by realizing that the enemy we are facing has different forms and manifestations. And we must not be fooled to think that by overcoming one of its forms or manifestations means that we have incapacitated the enemy entirely. Uh, colonialism was a manifestation of the enemy. Apartheid was a manifestation of the enemy. Neocolonialism is a manifestation of the enemy. Our real enemy is white supremacy which is an institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression of black people by white people for the purpose of maintaining and defending a system of wealth, power and privilege. And this remains the main objective of every form and manifestation of the enemy. Neocolonialism therefore is just a new way of executing an old project, which is to exploit and subjugate our people primarily for economic uh, benefit. Family independence uh, for African states and democracy as we call it for South Africa did not expunge the enemy. And some people are still fooled here to think that 1994 uh, brought about our freedom. Yes, we have to acknowledge and we have to appreciate our liberation struggle fighters who, who brought about the end of apartheid. But we must understand that the end of apartheid was not the end of the war. It was actually the beginning. Uh, so, so it must be clear to all of us that the enemy is still very much in our camp and he still has a very strong grip on us, perhaps now more than ever. Uh, I want to state that it is more divisive and dangerous, uh, and I'm speaking to neocolonialism here, it is more divisive and dangerous because it, it, it tricks us with an illusion of freedom. It gives us an illusion of freedom. Uh, because it doesn't necessarily institutionalize brutality or parade its weapons. Therefore, it gives us the impression that the war is over. Although every now and then it's, it's true cruelty in the form of violence towards black people is still seen. Uh, and unfortunately, some people, some black people believe in television so much that if something is not shown on TV, then it does not exist. Uh, media, in actual fact, family, is the best tool, the most divisive tool in the hands of the enemy, because it is media that is continuously used uh, for, for propaganda purposes and where Black people's minds are continuously conditioned. And, and I think I want to call upon us, family, uh, at this moment, to really review the time we spend in front of the television, consuming all the rubbish that we consume from there. We need to caution uh, the amount of, of, of time we spend there because even our children, as we watch TV, are watching and they are growing up watching uh, all of these things that condition their minds. Uh, so, so I'm just calling upon us to be very careful again of what we put into our minds. I believe very strongly in the input process and output uh, system. Whatever is put in is what we will see coming out. So we must pay careful attention of what we put into our minds. Uh, and, 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 and I think TV is one of the greatest distractions and, and one of the tools used really to destroy and continue to destroy the minds of our people. And, 
this enemy is far more dangerous because it kills you <laughs> while it smiles at, at, at you. The enemy kills you while he smiles at you. Uh, and I'm still talking about neocolonialism here. And I'm proving why it is a more divisive and more dangerous manifestation or form of oppression that stems from white supremacy. Because the enemy, while he's smiling at you, he's actually plotting to kill you. And it is, it is more invisible. Therefore, we think that it does not exist. It is also dangerous because it recruits us to fight against ourselves. Neocolonialism authenticates itself through black people who are used to devastate and to destroy their own people. And I am reminded of a picture I once saw of a forest that said it kept on voting for the X because uh, its handle was made from wood. And uh, they def it therefore thought that because the ex looks like us, uh, he is one of us, when in fact it was the one destroying them. In the same way, many black people are put in positions of power to make us feel like we are safe, to make us feel like we are represented, when in fact that is when we die the most in the hands of other black people. A good example here is that of Barack Obama, when Barack Obama came into office, America was very hopeful. Black people were hopeful that finally they have a black president and you know, their problems uh, will, will, will at least be obliterated because he's going to enforce policies that are going to you know, be, be pro-black. Uh, but you'd be shocked to actually know that during his term of office, police brutality was on the rise. It did not increase. It was, it was actually worse. And while he, he effected policies for other people, there was absolutely no policy that was pro-Black and looked into resolving the issues of Black people. And uh, you would say, but he was a Black president and he was a good example, but he was not family. And, and, and that is the danger of neocolonialism. That is the danger of imperialism. It can give you a Black face to make you, you know, to make you uh, drop your guard, to make you loosen your guard and, and, and not fight because you feel that you are represented and you feel that you are safe because you are with one of your own. When in fact, uh, that is when you have been killed the most. I'm also dared to say that black on black violence is, is this white supremacist project. Uh, xenophobia, tribalism, and even the current brutality that we see in Nigeria is the white man's scheme. It is the white supremacist colonial project. And because it is invisible, uh, we, 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 we lose focus and we think that this problem uh, comes solely internally, when in fact the white colonial master still has a hand um, in our camps and he's still using the same old rule of divide and conquer. So while we are focusing on, on our own fights and squabbles, the real enemy, the real criminal uh, is, is continuing to exploit and to suck us dry. And, and that is the danger of neocolonialism. Now, Samora Machel uh, understood neocolonialism uh, when he coined the phrase Aluta Continua. He actually once gave a speech of Aluta Continua. And after saying Aluta Continua, he posed a question, against what? Against what does the struggle continue? And uh, I, I think a lot of us uh, love the phrase Aluta Continua, but the question still remains, against what does the struggle continue? Uh, Samora understood that although Mozambique claimed its independence from the Portuguese, this was not the end of it. It was just the beginning. In one of his speeches, like I said, um, he kept on using the phrase Aluta Continua. It was actually his signature in a lot of his speeches. And, and, and when, he, when he poses the question, against what does the struggle continue? Uh, this is how he answers the question. He says the struggle continues 
against hunger. Uh, now, some people will say in Lala, I bulan, which means hunger does not kill. But you would be shocked of the stats of, of the many African people that die because of hunger. Hunger remains the greatest threat to African life. And this again speaks to the issue of self-sustenance and self-sufficiency. If we cannot feed ourselves and if we continue to die from hunger, then surely the struggle continues. Surely uh, we are not yet free. Surely it is not yet Uhuru. He also says the struggle continues against tribalism. We cannot achieve a collective goal when we are still divided. Now, there's still a lot of people in South Africa uh, where you'll hear Amazulu saying they only associate with Amazulu and they want nothing to do with Abesut or Amatos or Amapedi or whatever the case is. There's still a lot of tribalism. And then I ask myself, we talk about the United States of Africa. We talk about the possibility of uniting a continent, yet we cannot be united in a country. We talk about how we want to be united as, as, as a continent and be one, but still amongst ourselves, there's squabbles, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's issues amongst ourselves. And the struggle then continues. We must look into the issues that continue to separate us because we can indeed not win this fight if we are in isolation and if we are scattered. Our greatest ammunition, our greatest ammunition against white supremacy remains our black solidarity. I'm reminded of Hoover from America who was once asked, Uguti, what did he fear the most? Uh, and he said, uh, one of the things that scared him the most was Negroes United. Our unity black, uh, black family remains our greatest ammunition against white supremacy. We must unite. And Samora Michelle realized all of this. And he says, the struggle continues against uh, tribalism. He also said, the struggle continues against superstition. And this speaks to the many lies that neocolonialism has imposed on us and the fear that it has instilled in us. And I think this is one of the, the divisive tools of neocolonialism. It has put a fear so deep in us that when you begin to want to stand up and fight oppression and fight uh, you know, a, a, a subjugation system, you are reminded that uh, you will be fired. You are reminded that uh, you have a family to feed. And this is a conversation I, I always have with my friends. Uguti, truly, we, we need to be economically emancipated because there's a lot of people that want to fight unfairness, that want to fight injustice in workplaces, but they're scared to do so because uh, if they dare to stand up, that is a threat on their paycheck. That is a threat on their next meal. Uh, and so, we need, to, we need to rise up against the superstitions that uh, we are dependent on white people and we cannot do anything without white people. It is false. Uh, we just need to realize our power and this power, like I said, would, would be realized in our solidarity. We also saw this with the cliques debacle uh, when we were being insulted there. You know, there was, as valid as it is, or oh, the people are going to lose their jobs if they protest, if they, if they rise up and stand against the injustice that is perpetuated against them. But then I have a question for us, family. How much longer are we going to be held ransom? How much longer are we, are we not going to revolt and fight? Because if we dare to do so, then uh, we are frustrated uh, economically. I agree that this is, is a valid point to raise, but are we not being held ransom? Are we not uh, being held ransom and, and back into a corner? Uti, you, you cannot fight because if you fight, there are certain things that we are going to strip away from you. So the struggle continues, aluta continua. The struggle continues against misery. Uh, 
our people still live in misery and it is poverty again that puts our people in such a predicament. You know, white people will say, but um, apartheid is over, we need to move on. But who still lives in shacks? Who still goes to bed without a meal? Who is still grappling with the effects of colonialism? Who is still frustrated and you know strangled uh, by by the system that continues to subjugate and oppress our people, uh, and 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 they speak from a place of convenience and as in a place of privilege, and this is something you must know about white supremacy. White supremacy has fans. White supremacy has supporters. White supremacy has advocates. White supremacy has ambassadors. White supremacy has, has supporters. You know, white supremacy has sponsors. White supremacy is a heavily funded project. Uh, someone once said oppression is a heavily funded project. There's a lot of money that goes into our continued uh, oppression. And so the struggle continues. Aluta continua against our, our people living in misery. He also says the fight continues against illiteracy. Uh, and he, he points out how important education is. Now, of course, our current education system is, is problematic. Uh, and some people tend to think that education in its essence is a Western thing. Uh, but I want to remind everyone that education is a very much African thing. We were the first uh, to have an education institution. And it is very important that we continue being educated uh, because if we are illiterate, then we are not empowered to take over and to, to make sure that we come out of the ruts of misery. So Aluta continua, the struggle continues against illiteracy. He then says the struggle continues against exploitation. Um, of course, this is still relevant today. And it's sad to see how comfortable we have become with our exploitation and how our main focus is, is to survive. You know, a lot of us nowadays just look at, at, at means to survive. We're not looking at means of thriving. We're not looking at means of, of, of taking over the land and taking over what belongs to us. As long as we survive, as long as we can get through the month, as long as you know we can we can cover the basic necessities, then we are happy. But family, we must continue fighting against exploitation. In my closure, I want to say that the struggle continues. As long as we are landless, the struggle continues. As long as we go to bed hungry, aluta continua. As long as we are dehumanized and subjugated and exploited, aluta continua. The struggle continues. And uh, we can learn a lot from Samora Machel, who understood very well that uh, this is not the end. We must be conscientized and we must realize that we also have a role to make sure that we continue fighting for the liberation of our people. Aluta continua. Uh, family, I will be stopping there and I will be handing over to Uko Dite Usombisi. Uh, Lita, I hope again that I have laid a somewhat good foundation for you. Uh, I know you're also going to spend a great deal of your time talking about the, the, the issue that is going on in Nigeria. Uh, I must thank you again, Usombisi, for for you making these platforms uh, possible, for always being keen on us coming on these platforms and making sure that we continue with the great work. Uh, I enjoy so much working with you and I wish that we can continue on this path that we have started. Uh, over to you, Mkloninsho. Testing, Samora Mashel. Aluta continua. Samora Mashel. And Zonzo, Mabuya, Guliwe, 
wena udla ublongo dot ama dot ngo sai kaeto nyabo amfuetu and um, thank you for the foundation you have laid and uh, i also share your sentiments about um, the spirit in which we are working and we are doing this you know i i share uh, those sentiments it is a pleasure it is an honor as well to be working with you uh, and i hope we can do many more things you know for our people because as senzeliti we are doing this for our race you know um so i'm really hoping that we can do more and more bigger things um i've noted some of the key things that you oh i'll tell you also let me also you know He's just greeting in John, you know. Brakebi, everybody else, la ponge babona, babu muti se umshengu kosazana, and everybody else who babu bonga ni who has tuned in. Bonga ya cool, ugo tini chat is katse nu, ni zoba lana nati, yabo. And the other important thing is that. Um, we must not underestimate the privilege of having ourselves as black people talking to each other. You know, Ngoba, one of the things that the invasion from by the Arabs and the Europeans have done is that they have also become our spokespersons, you know. So when we have to even speak to each other, they become our intermediaries. And this is why you find a lot of black people today think it is a criminal offense to have blacks only meetings you know but afri forum and white people can meet alone and black people see nothing wrong with it but the minute black people meet on their own and they talk on their own black people are the first ones to get nervous and they are not getting nervous for themselves they get nervous on behalf of white people you know what is called you know um it's a vicarious nervousness. They are not nervous for themselves. They are, you know, you know, there are these blacks who talk white supremacy, you know, and I've got a white friend and my children have got white friends and they are not racist. You know, you know, I can't understand this thing. So we have this nervousness. So we don't take this platform for granted, you know, that you have black people coming here because uh, we must encourage more and more black people to understand that it should be normal in our own land for us to meet and talk like this. And in your presentation, Jay and Lonzo, I just want to note a couple of things that really um, caught my attention, you know, and one of them has to do with um, the point that you made about us now, you know, I know the measure that people use is that 20 what what years after democracy. 20 what what years after democracy you made the point that we still can't feed ourselves you know and i don't know if you were listening with this senegal thing you know in the free state about this um uh, what happened in senegal and the big thing there which is now a huge story one of the things that the white um, land thieves were saying you know was that uh, uh, they must be respected also because they are the ones who are feeding us you know um, that's what they got. These guys who wear khaki clothes. I also see black farmers now uh, also wear khaki clothes. I don't know why. Why is it written that if you are a farmer, uh, you must wear khaki clothes? Um, now it's a scandal, you know, that for us as the natives, we can be told by invaders and foreigners that they are feeding us, you know. And I was just sitting and thinking is that if indeed they are the ones who are feeding us, um, can you imagine what can happen if they decide one day to just poison us? You know, now you see the point that I'm making is that uh, food or food production is not simply a matter of nutrition or health. It's also a matter of sovereignty and security. And this is why before invasion, our warrior kings and queens had specific people who cooked for them you know, because they understood these things at a deeper level. One of them is my great uh, ancestor, you know, you know, uh, he was during the kingdom in the 1800s. He was one of the specialized um, cooks 
for the Zulu monarchy. That was his role. Um, then the other one, you, you, you went to town on neocolonialism, and I think it's at the center of many of the problems here. And interesting that you mentioned neocolonialism because even the political parties that are classified as liberation movements in South Africa don't talk anymore about neocolonialism, you know. And when you listen to them, they create the impression that our fight was for democracy. Oppressed people don't fight for democracy. They fight for liberation from their oppressors. Because democracy is a system of governance, you know, which has its genesis uh, amongst the Greeks and later the Europeans. But when that system was conceived, it did not have Africans in mind. And this is because it was not conceived by Africans. So one of the things I always also make is that one, if you listen to what is called struggle songs, you will never hear a struggle songs that talks about democracy. You know, all the struggle songs talk either about land, or there's no struggle song that says is a fairly democracy. It's always is a fairly zweletu or is a fellow mshaba way to or is a fellow ban bagit. So this democracy thing, it's a white people's thing that they are just using as a sleeping tablet. And we are now making it our thing. That's why you can find people can say, I've got a democratic right to do this and this, but they still go hungry. They also have a democratic right to go hungry and a democratic right to be shot at by the police. The other point you raised is the one about the media I and mean, how the media continues to brainwash and you know, the mass media. Um, yeah, it, it's a painful one because, uh, you know, there is this thing that we don't want to talk about. I look at programs like, or channels like, um, what is this thing that has, a, this, that was, what is this channel that screens Joop Joop's thing? Uh, much a laugh. Much a laugh. You know, uh, it uses our parlance, Jenga Bandabam Milingo, yeah, too much a laugh. But how much of that content that is on that much a laugh thing projects us as Black people positively and truthfully and honestly? You know, I personally, Black family, don't get that impression when I watch those programs on much a laugh, you know. And it's almost as if uh, that Moja love thing thrives on making black people appear disorganized, broken families, alcoholics, people who just cheat left, right, and center, uh, and don't know whether they are coming or going. Now, do you want to tell me that there are no positive stories that Moja love uh, can profile? Because the overwhelming stories or programs there, and they are growing every week you check, there's another one that comes in. There's another one now, you promised to marry me. You know, to come and clown on national television, elderly people to just come and humiliate and um, what you call embarrass themselves. There's a lot we can do with our time. Television is a powerful medium. There's a lot of proper content we can expose our children to. But we have those things, Bo. Uh, you promised to marry me. You know, we are dollar nine nine. Hi, Bo Bagit. There are a lot of positive things we can project. Television is a powerful medium, and we must not underestimate the power of uh, the repetition and the broad exposure of our children to negative stories and negative images about us. We must not underestimate that. And we must have a discussion about this Moja Love channel. You know, we must have a discussion about it in my view. Um, then the last one is, um, you spoke about black solidarity being our main weapon against white supremacy. I cannot agree more. You know, um, it's absolutely the case. Now, uh, I'm just trying to confirm with those remarks that you've laid a very firm basis uh, for my presentation. Um, I'm also not going to eat into the time of the people here. Now, I'm going to present in two parts. Um, I'll speak a bit about Dubabu Samora Michelle and some of the other things that I just thought we could uh, augment. And then I will conclude with uh, the part that deals with 
what they call the fight for police brutality in South Africa, in um, Nigeria, uh, the campaign NSARS, you know, uh, and what that entails. Now, if I'm just going to use the approach, I'm going to use, um, you know, me and structure. So I'm going to address seven questions. You know, the first question is going to be what, what are the connections between the Mozambican and the South African struggle? The second question is going to be, um, what was the revolution about uh, in South Africa? You hear when Zonzo says, uh, Aluta continue, you know. Now, what is this thing le, that must continue? That must now continue. What was the source of it? The third one is going to be, what went wrong in the South African revolution? You see, that today you must hear on Zonzo saying to us, uh, Aluta continue and Unzonzo saying we are not free. So what went wrong that we end up being almost back to square one? Then I will reflect on something which uh, is not spoken of a lot, apartheid era looting and elite dealing. And then um, I'll also reflect on another question. What is the declaration of freedom meant for black people? And then the last one, like I said, is going to be a reflection on police brutality in Nigeria, you know, uh, but there's a broader theme that I have there. Um, just to um, to start us off, um, as, as part of the connection, trying to draw this connection between the Mozambican and the South African struggle, there are two very interesting moments or events I want to reflect on. The first one is um, in 1974, the movement of Steve Biko, the South African Students' Organization. Um, under the leadership of a, a revolutionary called Mundo Mieza. Uh, in 1974, September, they held what they called Viva Frele Morales here in South Africa. Uh, what were the Viva Frele Morales? These were rallies that were held by the Black Consciousness Movement to celebrate the victory of uh, Frelimo in um, Mozambique. They were held here in South Africa. Um, and in reaction, the apartheid regime, you know, harassed, arrested them, and many of them landed themselves in Robben Island, you know, Muntumiaza amongst them, uh, Terra Lekota amongst them, he was in the Black Consciousness Movement at the time, Zitule Lekwindi, he is the current secretary, Ubabu Kwindi, of the Azanian People's Organization, uh, Ubabu, um, who are the other ones? Obabu Pandelani in a fall of water. You know, many of them ended up in Robben Island as a result of a commemorating or celebrating the victory of the people of Mozambique in South Africa. You know, and if you remember, those of you who have watched uh, the movie Cry Freedom, you know, which tries to give a perspective on the life and you know, who Steve Biko was, you would remember that in Cry Freedom there is a scene where Denzel Washington, who plays Steve Biko, testifies uh, in court, you know. Uh, in fact, there's a, a huge part of it. Now, that, that uh, scene or that part where Denzel testifies in court is taken from true life experience. The person who testified in court was Steve Biko at this trial in 1974. He was called to give a testimony. And as you know, for those who've read, I write what I like. He turned the whole um, court appearance into a lecture on black consciousness. You know, uh, so that is the one moment that connects us to the people of Mozambique. The other one is the song "Aluta Continua," which we were playing just before we started, um, which was uh, performed by Umamu Zenzile Makeba, and many of you know her as Umamu Miriam. Yabo, uh, the song was written by her daughter, Usis Bongi, after Umamu Zenzile um, as part of the delegation from Guinea at the time when she was in exile in Guinea, in Conakry. She attended the independence celebrations of um, Mozambique in 1975, and she got to interface and uh, learn more about the struggle of the people of Mozambique while she was there. And that's what inspired the song, Aluta Continua. And it was written, like we said, by her daughter, you know. Now, we make that point to just show that um, the struggle of the people of um, Mozambique, you know, like Unzonjo correctly said, was connected to our struggle. Now, 
as it relates to the assassination ga babu samora machel which is what i want to focus on briefly um ubabu ndondo has given the biographical stuff and he has told you the things that ubabu machel achieved and he has given you uh, his legacy and the relationship with thomas sankar i want to focus a bit on the circumstances of his death and more specifically his assassination uh, as you know it happened in 1986 uh, in on the 19th of october which means he was killed a year sankara was killed you know like nlondo said two good friends sankara was killed the following year in 87 you know he was killed just a year before sankara was killed and they had met ubabu uh, nlondo is correct and they were good friends you know and had a lot in common you know ideologically as well now he was coming from a meeting that evening of the 19th of uh, October, he was coming from a meeting in Lusaka, you know, and that meeting was a meeting that was meant to look at how to take the struggle further to liberate, especially part of the subcontinent, what we now call SADC, you know, that is the meeting he was coming from. And um, he was instructed, you know, by his security detail that they would prefer that he sleeps over and not travel in the evening, but he insisted. One of the reasons why he insisted, he wanted to be on time for the birthday, Kamamukra Samashel, you know, who was his uh, second wife. He wanted to be in, in time for her birthday. So they probably did not understand why the rush, you know, um, so that was the thing. Unfortunately, um, the plane crashed, as you know, you know, along the mountain range, Yasemuzin, you know, so in a triangular uh, border area between what is called South Africa, Mozambique, and uh, Eswazin, that's where the plane crashed that evening. Now, two findings were made by two separate commissions. The other finding was that um, it was a pilot error. The other finding was that the beacon that is used to guide the aircraft, which was a Russian aircraft, a Tupolev TU, uh, the beacon was, um, there was a beacon that was misleading, you know, which means a decoy, because if you have more than one beacon, it can mislead. So the finding of the Russians, you know, because um, it was actually their aircraft, the make of the aircraft, that uh, Tupolev Tu-134A uh, was a Russian-made aircraft. They are the ones who found that actually there was a decoy, which was a decoy beacon, which led to that. Now, it's also important to note that before Ubabu Mashel was killed, you know, uh, because I believe he was killed, he confronted the president of Malawi at the time, Hastings Banda, you know, um, and then said to him, he is aware that uh, Upanda is assisting the counter revolutionary movement called Rinamu, you know, which was uh, funded also by the apartheid government through AMSCO. You see the company called AMSCO. Uh, AMSCO was funding uh, Rinamu to destabilize um, Mozambique. They even bombed bridges. That's what. That's how counter-revolutionary they were. Now, Hastings Banda of Malawi uh, was in uh, was collaborating with the apartheid government against Samora Machel, and Samora Machel picked it up. That um, this is the thing that was happening, and after he confronted him. Uh, he also then went to a press conference and made the point that if a Banda does not stop his nefarious activities, you know, uh, he would place a missile or missiles at the border of Mozambique and Malawi, you know. Soon after that, um, thousands of uh, Rinamo troops left Malawi and they went into Mozambique, Northern Mozambique, and um, tensions escalated, you know. Um, but also before that, I'm now trying to show you the atmosphere. Um, at the border of Mozambique, six members of the South African Defense Force of the um, apartheid government died, you know, uh, when they a booby trap land, landmine killed them. The then Minister of uh, Defense, Magnus Malan, in response said, um, this was going to lead to a head-on clash between Mozambique and South Africa. 
Yeah. And he was also saying that during that time, Mozambique under Samora Machel had renewed its support for the ANC, you know, uh, in exile. Uh, in response to the killing of these uh, six officials or members of the South African Defense Force, uh, South Africa then terminated over 50,000 jobs, apartheid South Africa, of Mozambicans who were working in South Africa, you know, uh, as a sort of like punishment. But we also learn from the minutes of the cabinet, right, that um, There was a discussion at cabinet level in the South African cabinet, especially the security, what is called the, uh, there's this thing called the State Security Council. They had a specific working group that was just focusing on um, Mozambique and in particular, um, Samara Machel. And they were also discussing in this working group how they can help Renamo to overthrow uh, Frelimo, you know, now, Samora Machel was aware of these things. Um, Mamu Grasa also states when he appeared at the commission, the Mago Commission that investigated, that she's of the view that immediately after Ubabu Samora Machel warned um, O Hastings Band, uh, there was a crisis meeting that was held in February 19 um, uh, in, 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 in Malawi, sorry, where the possible uh, assassination of Samora Machel was discussed with the South African Defense Force, amongst others, um, Magnus Maland, the Minister of Defense at the time, you know. Um, now, these are some of the things, you know, that uh, were part of the circumstances, you know, that informed the assassination or precipitated. But also there were divisions within the organization of Samora Machel. And part of the divisions had to do with the fact that he was restructuring the military and the cabinet. And this upset uh, some of the high ranking uh, officials. Now, this is also not uh, too dissimilar. Part of the reason why Sankara also got killed, right? Was because Sankara, also did some restructuring within his own party. You know, he was weeding out the thieves, the sellouts uh, uh, within his own party. So just like uh, Thomas Sankara, in the run up to the assassination of Ubabu Samara Machel, Ubabu Samara Machel had enemies, both uh, external and internal, you know. And Umamu Krasa, who herself, was not just an activist, uh, but also got military training, states it clearly that, um, that even before they actually got Ubabu Samora Machel on the 19th of um, October, 1986, there were many attempts on his life before that, you know? Um, so that was the final and the most successful attempt. But what is also interesting one of the first people at the scene of his uh, plane crash was the foreign affairs minister of South Africa, Pug uh, Bota at the time. And at the site of the crash, Pug Bota spoke about how the death of Samora Machel and the other people who died, over 20 of them, was a loss to the South African government, the apartheid government, which could not be true because if you go to the minutes of the apartheid cabinet and the state security council, that diabolic body, the views that are expressed in the minutes of the state security council contradict what Pug Bota was saying at the crash site, the Samora Machel. Now in the South African context, for me, the rugged dagger through my heart was when the ANC paid tribute to Pug Bota when he died. And Pug Bota is one of the people who was supposed to be interrogated to tell us who actually killed Samora Machel. And he was praised by the ANC, you know, when he passed on 
da 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 for me it was just like a rugged dagger uh, through my heart you know that here is somebody uh, who you know if you study the history objectively participated in the mass murder of many black people not just in what is called south africa in mozambique in angola in zimbabwe in malawi work border as part of the inner circle of the apartheid government they killed many black people some who today are still buried in shallow graves and we don't know where they are and this man was praised right we leave that we go to our second point our second point or question is what was the revolution about in south africa you know unzonzo was saying earlier aluta continua but what is this that must continue um the um one of the things that informed you see this thing scb is a namu shamanje sikulmange struggle you know uh, or the liberation struggle or the revolution what started it what sparked it this thing was sparked by a group of dirty smelly mass murderers and rapists who came here uninvited as during the 1400s especially through the cape during the 1400s i know there's the 1652 story you know as early as the 1400 they were already here especially the portuguese you know and i'll later explain why the portuguese uh, were the ones who were able to travel more than the other europeans part of the reason is that the portuguese are the ones after stealing our navigation skills especially from some of our skilled navigators the moors the ones who civilized spain and built the first university in europe which you find today in spain the university of salamanca it's the oldest university in europe it was built by us the moors we built it now they stole the navigation skills the portuguese of our people and this is why they were amongst the first to be here so some of the first people to engage them uh, in warfare are the people that are erroneously referred to as the koi and the sun you know they were the first people to engage them amongst them you had freedom fighters like gogosa freedom fighters like doman there was even another one david stirman who was a koi leader the interesting thing about david stirman is that if ungumkhos and uma was tagazela uthi ungurhudulu urhudulu ngu david stirman that's where is tagazela kwaxhosa saka urhudulu ochangisa come from it's a it's a koi leader urhudulu who fought against the dutch i'm now also trying to show you that uh these people, our people who call themselves the Khoi and the Sun, they are no different from us. I hear people talking about the Bantu and the what, what. There are no such things. Those are constructs that were designed by racist anthropology and racist sociologists. They designed those labels. So you had those type of people. Uh, the municipality in the Grahamstown area Remember, it's now named uh, Makanda. You know, I know they call it Makana. It's not supposed to be Makana, Makanda. You know, he is a leader, Yamakos, who also fought alongside to Stirman Hutulu, Gusandi Le Makandi, Stagazela Saka Ngupungan, Makulukulu Shubi. There's no Makana. It's Makanda, Gusandi Le Makanda, Upungan. He was one of those who were incarcerated in Robben Island. You know, uh, I hope that municipality is not called Makana. It should be Makanda. They are say a Kremstown. I hope it's called Makanda because they are not honoring him if they don't even pronounce his name correctly. You know, and they must refer to him as a king. You know, every anybody who fought and fights and sacrificed for us deserves the honor of being a king or a queen. Um, you also had uh, kings like Hosi Khaleshiwe, you know, uh, where I was born. The uh, colonialists refer to it as Kimberley, you know, in the Northern Cape. There's no such thing as Kimberley. That place that you call Kimberley, the so-called Diamond City, 
is named after a British secretary of colonies, Lord Kimberley. That place is Ha Halishewe. There are no people who come from Kimberley. That's why when you go to Australia, you find places named Kimberley. They are named after the British secretary who was a thief and a colonialist. And we can't honor those types of things. Now there was a king there, Luka Mbolokeng Jainki. He was one of the first kings to deal in diamonds. He was a diamond trader, which means there's no such thing as the discovery of diamonds. Your history books are lying. There's no such thing as the, dis I know there is that chapter in the history books, the discovery of diamonds, the discovery of gold. If gold was discovered in the, eight, in the late eight, uh, 1890, 18, yeah, 1800s in so-called Johannesburg, right? Um, Mapungupwe was there before gold was discovered. Mapungupwe. And Mapungupwe was, you know, iron smelters and people who were dealing in gold. You know, and Mapungupwe is just here. Mapungupwe is not far from Johannesburg, you know? So how do you discover gold when there is an empire that is over 200 years old where people were using gold and smelting iron? And we go along, gold was discovered in Johannesburg. So when white people encounter things for the first time, those things come into existence because white people have encountered them. So this thing also, I love because this thing Yoguti we say, eh, Josie, the city of gold, you know? What happened at eh, Josie happened almost 200 years after what happened in Mapungupu. So gold was not a new thing for us. So we behave as if the digging of gold and it being used for other things is something that we were taught by Europeans. So they engaged um, these kings, you know, they engaged these invaders and uh, the kings that I've named and one of them, Inkosi Uyinzaka Kauta, the one who was beheaded by the British. Are you aware that till this day, Ikanda Lake Asigal Tol, the British took it. They did the same with this other king I referred to in the Diamond Ridge area, Jose Luka Jainki. The British took his head. Now, the other important thing to note is I'm talking the period between 1400 to say 1803, right? There's no ANC, there's no PAC, there's no Azapo, there's no EFF. There are no political parties at the time. They are not even an idea, but our warrior kings and queen are engaging the enemy, they are fighting them. What is my point? The political parties that you see today who want to create the impression that they started the struggle are misleading us. And they are not fighting for the same things that our ancestors are fighting for, we're fighting for. Many of them are fighting for accommodation in the system that was created by the people who murdered and raped our ancestors. They are fighting to go to parliament, to go and sit with these people and talk to them, with them there and debate endless things. Now our ancestors knew who they were. That's why they did not debate with the invaders. They engaged them because they understood what it means to be a native. These ones who go around calling themselves our leaders, you know, don't understand the concept of nativity. Natives don't negotiate with invaders or foreigners. There's one question, anybody who is not a native, we have not asked them and we must get into the habit of asking them, what do you want here? Who invited you? That's what you do when you find somebody in your house, Uban, Ufunanla, now, our point of departure, I was listening to the respected leader of the EFF the other day saying, we don't want to fight with white people, we want equality with white people. Really? 
equality with white people. Since when have white people become the standard for what we aspire for? Why should white people be the standard for the things that we aspire to? We don't want equality. We want to reclaim our right as the natives of the land to be masters of our own destiny. That's what we want. We don't want equality with anybody because we don't owe anybody equality. We took nobody's equality. We want to be ourselves. We want to be ourselves. That's what we want. That's why we are fighting. That's why our, we want to be ourselves, self-defined. That's what we want. We don't want equality. So after that, then you had a skirmish that followed say between the period of 1894 to about um, 1904, to, you know, where the British now came in the 1800s, you know, and then they had a skirmish. There were these skirmishes between the British and the, and the Dutch, you know, who we today erroneously refer to as the Afrikaners. There's no Afrikaners, these people are Dutch, you know. Um, so now those skirmishes, you know, led to amongst others, what was called the Anglo-Boer War, another misnomer. There's no Anglo-Boer War, it's the Anglo-Dutch War. It's the Dutch and the British or the English who were fighting for our resources. Which war culminated in the formation of the Union of South Africa in 1910, you know. So, this thing that we today call South Africa was not created by us, this polity, right? It was not created by us. And this is why it is weird to hear ourselves call ourselves South Africans. Because if you look at the etymology and you look at the genesis of the name South Africa, right? Uh, it was not a creation of us, the natives. Okay, yeah, sure. So now that that being the case, the last point to make on that subject is central to the narrative that I just gave here was that everything centered around the fight for our land, its repossession not its expropriation, it's repossession, not its, ex, its, its expropriation. You know, we are not going to expropriate anything. You repossess, you take back what's yours and you will decide how you take it back. Now, I was just making that point to show that two important things, one, the political parties did not start our anti-colonial resistance. They did not invent it. They either benefited from it or they distorted it. Two, our anti-colonial resistance central to it in us reclaiming our land, our essence was the land question. And until that question is resolved, we can't be talking Uhuru. My third point, What went wrong in the South African revolution? One of the things that went wrong in my view is that our people at the beginning of the 20th century, our people started to organize themselves along Eurocentric lines in terms of political parties, you know, Eurocentric political parties. For instance, when the ANC was formed, right, in 1912, and the 1913 Land Act was passed the following year. You know what the ANC did under the leadership of people like Abu Solomon Tekishop, like many of whom I respect, they wrote to the King of England to protest that the Land Act is disadvantaging black people and they can't understand. I will share with you their deputation. It will break your heart. They refer to themselves in that deputation 
as the loyal subjects of your majesty. You know, and there are people in the ANC who, pre, who, who either don't know this history or they pretend not to know it. At formation, this is how they looked at themselves, loyal subjects of your majesty. Now, this is why till this day, South Africa is a member of the Commonwealth, you know, which is a club of the British royal family, right? Why do you think South Africa is still a member of the Commonwealth? And all the countries that were colonized by Europe, by Britain rather, go to, um, to, to England, you know, when they are called by the British royal family. And they get dressed in those funny Victorian clothes. You know, I've seen all our presidents go there and they look like very funny characters, you know, because they must continue to show that they continue to be subjects of her majesty. That's where this thing comes from, you know. Now, um, between 1912 and say 1940, right, the preoccupation of the ANC was with being accommodated in what they called the union. And part of the reason why they were fighting for accommodation was that many of the people who led the ANC were products of colonial education, right? Many of them were doctors, da 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 da, -da lawyers and professional people. And many of them, remember, came from missionary schools, you know? So they had a strong affinity for the British, you know? And like the British, remember they did funny things. I see now it's a hairstyle. Uh, they even, you know, as people who were educated, you know, this line that they used to have, you see in the old photos, you know, that was part and parcel of the way of distinguishing themselves from the people that they refer to as Samakaba because they were men of letters. I see now it's a style now that people do, but the origin of that thing has to do with, because if you look at the English aristocracy, that thing was something that the English aristocracy did. These people who influenced our people in the Eastern Cape, you hear black people in the Eastern Cape now, ne? they call other people chap. Have you heard that thing, le chap? You know, that thing is something from the English. It's not, it, u chap, I saw cause. You know, I know people think it's a cause thing. It's not a cause thing. It's something from the British or English aristocracy, you know. But the point that one is making is that between 1912 and 1940, you know, that was the orientation until something more fundamental happened. A gentleman by the name of Muziwa Kelembete came into the scene and they formed uh, what was called at the time the Congress Youth League and what we know today as the ANC Youth League. You know, if you go and look at the founding manifesto and policy document of the ANC Youth League, you know, it's one of the most Afrocentric, conscious, well thought out, coherent, radical documents ever written by black people in the 20th century. Not this pretentious radicalism, as Ibonamanji. You must go and read that document, you know. And that was the first time in the history of the ANC where there was a move to make the ANC African-centered, as the name suggests, African National Congress. But what then happened is that at that time, the ANC was already under the influence of the communist, they were called the CPSA at the time, before they were called the SACP, Communist Party of South Africa. Then later they became the South African Communist Party. The ANC was already under the spell of the Congress of Democrats, you know, the DA of the time. The ANC was already under the spell of the Natal Indian Congress at that time. And the ANC Youth League posed a threat to the dominance of the communists, the Indians, and the white Democrats in the ANC, who wanted to make sure that the ANC remains as multiracial as possible. You know? And this is why they fought tooth and nail you know, in the 1949 
uh, Congress of the ANC in Bloemfontein, where what is called the 1949 Program of Action, one of the most radical programs of the ANC in its history, was adopted. That program was influenced by the ANC Youth League um, under the leadership of, uh, amongst others, uh, APM Dai and Umangaliso Sobuko was in the ANC at the time. Because Ubabu um, So Ulona had passed on at the time. By 1949, he had passed on Ubabu Muzwa Kelembedi. But then what happened is that a huge fight was um, waged by the whites, the Indians, and the communists, the white, the Jewish communists within the ANC to kill this project that sought to bring the ANC to our roots. And this led to the adoption of the Freedom Charter in 1955. What is my point? The Freedom Charter was a direct counter to the African nationalism of the ANC Youth League of the 1940s. Direct counter. And this is why you see, if you read the opening line of the manifesto of the ANC Youth League, the ANC Youth League manifesto says two important things. The struggle of the Africans must be led by Africans themselves. Two, the land belongs to Africans and African only. What does the Freedom Charter say? South Africa belongs to all who live in it. That line was not put in there and at the top innocently. It was a direct counter to the manifesto of the ANC Youth League and the 1949 political program to make sure that the ANC is captured. You see when, when, when capture started, it captured did not start with the Zondo Commission. Now, coming this way, um, there were attempts to still bring uh, us to the African center. Um, the adoption of the Freedom Charters, you know, led to the formation of the PAC, right? You know, because that's one of the basic reasons why the PAC was formed, because they thought uh, this was just a sellout project. So the, the, the PAC was formed. Um, then um, it happened, you know, you had Sharpeville uh, 1960, which was led by the PAC, da da da, coming this way. And you had this whole balance, you know, of Africanism under Obabu Sobukwe and Israel to Africa coming this way. Then you also had, after the PAC, the formation of the Black Consciousness Movement led by Ustif Biko, you know, which also tried to, if you like, you know, strengthen the work that was done by organizations like the PAC, you know, which is to bring us to the center, which is the African center, you know. But here's the thing, you know, um, to cut a long story short, um, as part of continuing the work that was done by people like Obobabu Lembet, you know, and Obobabu Sobukwe, are you aware that at the time that Steve Biko was killed, September 1997, he was busy on a mission to try and initiate unity talks amongst the new unity movement, the PAC, and the ANC. There was even a discussion to have him smuggled out of the country to go and meet with Ubabu over Tambu. Steve Biko was killed when he was on that mission. And that's why in some of his writings, he says he would have liked to have seen fewer groups with the PAC, the BC movement, and the, uh, the ANC coming together. You know, So they tried, but unfortunately, uh, he was killed. You know, and we know what they did to Babu Sobu. You know, uh, they 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 killed him uh, in the way that they brutalized him. You know, took him away from his family. He spent the last nine years lang kulelekon echalishew. You know, the house where Ubabu Sobu was under house arrest for the last nine years of his life. As a child, I played in that house number six na lady street you know i only learned later you know that i stepped on the same soil that ubabu sobuke stepped on they took this man away from him from lab you know um this is what these people did and this is how they killed him you know so 
to conclude this part, um, remember the question we are dealing with here is what went wrong with the South African revolution, right? This is the question we're dealing with here. There's a professor from Stellenbosch who passed on recently. Some of you know him, especially those of you who's, who like studying economics or political economy. Professor Sam Peter Blanche, you know, he gave very interesting interviews about how South Africa came to 1994, you know. And I just want to quote what he says. Open quote, the whole transition process was orchestrated by the mineral energy complex with Harry Oppenheimer and to a lesser extent, Anton Rupert. They organized everything. Early in the 1990s, there were regular lunches between Mr. Mandela and Harry Oppenheimer. When I became aware of it, I remember I was furious. For what must they have lunches? But these lunches developed into regular meetings at Little Brandhurst in the estates of the Oppenheimers. Close quote. So he is essentially saying this thing that happened in 1994 was all nicely, it was a production, a theater production. It was all staged by the minerals energy complex. You know, that's what he says. Um, now, one of the things uh, that we are going to talk about, and I know a lot of people don't want to talk about it, is uh, the people who hosted uh, our leader, Ubabu Mandela, when he came out of prison. You know, there's, we speak about the Ruperts a lot, we speak about the Oppenheimers a lot, but there's another powerful white family that controls South Africa's wealth, which is called the Menels. We don't speak about them, you know, because they are probably under the radar. They were the ones who were very supportive towards Ubau Madiba, even after it divorced you know, um, they offered him a place to stay and everything and accommodation. If you go and read their history, you will understand why. And there are also people who actually argue that that divorce was orchestrated, that it was an instruction from white capital, you know, which makes sense, at least in my mind, because if you look at the amount of time, money, and resources that were dedicated to demonizing Umamwini, and Ubabu Mandela was aware how Umamwini was demonized in life and in death. They even did the same thing with Umadlomo Uzinzi. You know, they continued the demonization. You know, it was not an innocent or isolated demonization because if you understand what Mamwini's position was with the negotiated settlement and with the land issue and where Uba Mandela stood, you understand why the captains of industry had to demonize her. Also, given the influence that she had, especially amongst the youth in the township, she was a problem. So she had to be demonized. You also know what Stratcom did to her. Which brings me to the point about apartheid era looting and elite dealing. Now, Every time this thing of corruption comes up, you know, uh, and I don't blame us because like you said in London, the media is powerful. Corruption has become synonymous with black people. You know, um, it has become synonymous with black people. So when you think of a corrupt person, you think of, I'm using the media's lens now, Ubabu Jacob Zuma, you know. And you even hear that the most corrupt person is Jacob Zuma. Jacob Zuma collapsed uh, the government. Uh, Jacob Zuma, and you even hear ANC people saying, what is this thing? Nine wasted years, you know? So here is this person, you know, uh, alone. He's the most corrupt person. He stole everything. Everybody else did not steal, you know? He stole everything. He ate everything. And everybody else was just watching him steal. This man is powerful, you know? And he is the embodiment of corruption, you know? So um, he is the, 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 what, the poster child for corruption. But is that really the case? You know, did corruption really start after 1994? Is corruption really an invention of black people? Um, between 1974 and 1994, right? There is a book called Apartheid Guns and Money. By Henry Van, by Henny Van Fieren, 
apartheid guns and money. It's a bit of a thick book, but uh, many of you I know would say you are not lazy to read. Please get the book, Apartheid Guns and Money. Very well researched, uh, nice references that you can go to. According to that book, right, uh, 500 billion was spent for the special defense account. This is now between 1974 and 1994, you know. 500 billion was spent for the special defense account of the defense force to do intelligence and other operations. Armsco, that was the arms manufacturer for the apartheid government, you know, formed 76 front companies in the 70s in Liberia. Here is a, a government in South Africa forming 76 front companies in an African country called Liberia. 29 of those companies were formed in Panama. Look where Panama is. Remember, there is this thing, this scandal that broke now, the Panama Papers, you know, about money laundering, about looting, and da 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 The apartheid government was highly involved in that thing. Um, the AMSCO weapons, like I said, many of you know that um, the South African Defense Force was destabilizing Zimbabwe, Angola, Lesotho, Swaziland, da da da. And in Angola, they were using a group called UNITA under Jonas Savimbi. Who supplied Jonas Savimbi with arms? It's AMSCO. And I think AMSCO changed, so it became part of the nail, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it became part of the nail. You know, they changed the name and they became the nail. You know, um, it's the same company. I think they've changed their name to Danella. I will just verify my facts, but I think it's the, I'm hoping Ulo Nusi Sumbali can help me, you know, because she would know. I see her nodding. Yeah, well, uh, so this company that's today called Danella, if I'm not mistaken, is that company that was manufacturing arms for the apartheid government to kill our people in um, Mozambique, Angola, amongst others, you know? Um, listen to this, 196 banks, in 27 countries helped AMSCO and the apartheid government move money around the world. 126, 96 banks in 27 countries. This is in the 70s, Bagit. The whole world essentially was collaborating with the apartheid government to steal our money and move it around the world for it to be used to buy arms to kill us. In the 70s, 196 banks in 27 countries. Now, even the Swiss banks, right? I'm told the Swiss are good. They like, they do the best chocolate, you know? They are also the most corrupt and the most vicious. A lot of our wealth that is stolen in Africa is stored in the Swiss bank. Till this day, the apartheid government was also using the Swiss banks. In some of the literature was going, across one of the um, managers of the UBS, the United Swiss Bank, was talking about how he believes black people are inferior. You know, the manager of the Swiss Bank, I will share that with you afterwards. Now, the other thing, and I know there are these people who like um, in, the, in the activist world who like Marxism, and they tell us about the Russians, you know, in Rwanda, but we politics, you know, quoting the Russians and they talk about Marxism and how the Chinese and the Russians supported us. Are they aware that China and Russia, even when there were sanctions against the apartheid government, China and Russia were supplying the apartheid government clandestinely with ammunition and intelligence and technology, China and Russia. There are these people who go around saying the Russians trained them in exile, the Russians gave them guns. The Russians were also trading with the apartheid government and the Chinese, who today, the Chinese are today one of South Africa's biggest trading partners on the basis of a false narrative that they supported us during the struggle. They also supported the apartheid government, the Chinese and the Russians. Um, even countries like Singapore, right? I know Singapore, 
people who work in the policy and the technology field like to use Singapore as a model, you know, for development and innovation. Even Singapore, for the apartheid government to get access to the Southeast Asian market at the time, Singapore was facilitating that. This Singapore, that is a model of innovation and all other things, you know, they conspired with the apartheid government against us. So many of you who are students, you know, and you are told about models and you get your PhDs or your master's degrees in models and you present nice papers on Singapore, just know that. The Singapore, yen. Companies like, as you know, Sunlam and Naspers. Remember Naspers is this company that controls our Mnet and about DSTV, right? It is now worth a trillion, over a trillion in our space, uh, national affairs. Are you aware that the biggest financier of the national party is NASPES? This company that we are paying through ETS TV today, they were the biggest financiers of the national party, including the national party under Utiter. They received money from them. So this money that, in fact, we should not be paying it to STV because Dalabes Patul. Dalabes Patul, because this, no, the truth is this company, Naspers, was formed with our money as black people and the blood of our people. So we should not even be paying for this DSTV thing as part of them apologizing, you know, but he's saying a cook. ETS TV, they are going to give it for free for us for the next 30 years. It sounds ridiculous, but if you look at the money they made and they stole from us and the cost at which that money was taken, you'll realize what I'm saying is not as ridiculous as it sounds because their money was used to kill us. All that I am saying, I'm making a flimsy example. I'm saying we must not pay for uh, the poison they feed us through DSTV, right? Now, there is a report also called the CX report, which was released in 1997. Now, your media won't tell you about these things because the media is part of this system. But the media will tell you about the Freda dairy farm. They will tell you about all the black people who are stealing, you know? But they won't tell you about these things that I just said, including the CX report of 1997 that was produced in the UK, which CX report said between 1985 and 1992, the South African Reserve Bank was involved in looting. South African Reserve Bank, this bank that is feared today and respected. Uh, they gave Sanlam 3.8 billion, the Rembrandt Group, Yabu Rupert, were given about two billion. Delma Chrysler was given five billion. Amsco, 14 billion. NetBank, 500 million. FNB also received money from them. Now, that's just a summary. I have the book here behind me. Elanje um, Umbambele. This is the source, you know, you see how thick the book is. I don't know if you can all see it. Yeah, this is the book. You know, look look at the spine of the book, you know. But I think I saw you, we must read it. Yeah, I can even do a summary for those who are afraid to read it. There's nothing here. This is very small. You can do this in a week's time. Right, right. So, Hey, guy, look at those in a week's time. This is This is nothing. Yeah, well. So, but my point is just that my last point before I step off that thing is that now you had a big fuss that uh, uh, in the mid 1990s, right? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? Um, now, did these white companies ever appear in front of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? For this amount of looting they have done, as stated in this book, Apartheid Guns and Money. 
It never happened. And they continue to trade. Many of you, I also have a Sunlam policy. You know, I also have a Sunlam policy. Uh, I don't want you to feel bad that you have a Sunlam policy. So, I also have a Sunlam policy, right? Now, Sunlam continues to get money from me and probably some of you. Sunlam never appeared at the Truth Commission or at the Zondo Commission. You know, they never appeared. They've got a beautiful head office in Cape Town. We think they are a prestigious company. All white companies, and I make this point always, and I want to have, they get a cognitive dissonance when I say this. All white companies are the proceeds of crime. There's no such thing as white entrepreneurship. There isn't. Because Europe was built on the back of the enslavement of Africans. You know, that's how Europe was built. So Sanlam, all these white companies, they were not built. I usually see on their website when they write seductive stories about this guy came with idea and that he was a chief. There was no such thing. All that thing is just nyaupe. These are all criminal enterprises, you know. We will know that if we know our history because there's no way people can come from where they come and they can have such money. And we in our own country can't do that. You understand? How did they get all of this money? How did they become so filthy rich? Because colonialism is a criminal enterprise. We go to the next point. You know, what has the declaration of freedom in 1997 meant for black people, right? Um, now, I want to go back to the point you made initially in Zonzo about us not even having the capacity. Now, 2020, we can't feed ourselves, you know? Uh, and people who think because on a credit card or you've got a check card and you can go and buy whatever you buy at the shop, that's not feeding yourself, you know? Because feeding yourself, you should not be going to buy from another person if you are feeding yourself. You should be eating what you are producing. You understand? So we are confusing being able to afford what other people produce with feeding ourselves. It's not the same thing. Yeah. Now, according to this book again, this book says 90% of the wealth in South Africa is in the hands of 10% of the population. Right? Now, if you want to break that down, it, it comes to plus minus seven families who own the wealth of South Africa. Seven families, white families, the Menels that I spoke about that you don't always hear about, the Ruperts, the Oppenheimans, the Gordons, the Beckers, the Hersoffs, and the Fenters. These are these big companies, you know, the, the ones that have, have even a global, pro, the Anglos, the Rembrandt groups, others, Ziaschaf Corp. What they do is that they have subsidiaries that are not in the name of the original company. So you sometimes think it's two different companies. Like Bitvest, have you guys seen Bitvest is eating everything in its way. Do you know, do you know that game uh, Sasi Jala Sisakula about to Pac-Man? I don't know if you see that thing with Pac-Man, you know? Have you seen that Pac-Man thing exactly how Pac-Man eat? This is what Bitvest is doing. Aiko Indo that Bitvest is not doing. I'm even thinking now, Uguti, you'll even hear Uguti, if Pete Vest is it Tyson and Mark Queen. Yeah. They are eating up everything. Go into their website or look at their history. If Pete Vest is not a South African company, it's owned by foreigners. You know, sharp. This book also says, it today, about 70 billion of taxpayers' money leaves in South Africa annually, 70 billion Yemali that just leaves the country. You know, what is called illicit financial or capital outflows. 
because it's definitely not going to the African continent. It's going to the Western world, 70 billion every year, illicit financial or capital outflows that leave South Africa. You see, sharp. Uh, I don't want to go into the, the poverty, you know, stats and what, what I think is SARS, not SARS, what's the state South Africa publishes this regularly, but as things stand, uh, some of the things we read is that the, the dynamics of poverty are such that poverty is more pronounced in the three rural provinces, you know, Limpopo, Eastern Cape and KZN, you know, uh, for obvious reasons, because of infrastructure issues and the historical issues of underdevelopment being endemic there. Then the other dimension is that um, in terms of gender, the most impoverished are black women. That's what, that's what the data SARS is saying, you know, it's black women. Uh, in terms of the age, um, it is black children compared to all other children, you know, who are the most uh, poor. And they even have a concept uh, which they talk about uh, multidimensional poverty, you know, which is poverty in whichever way you can imagine it, you know, that they are vulnerable to that. Um, You've heard about this thing, you know, about South Africa being the most unequal society in the world, you know, according to the Gini coefficient. Um, uh, I, 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 I want us to accept that carefully, you know. I don't want us to internalize it, Uguti, we are the most unequal country in the world. We are not the most unequal. I understand that measure in terms of uh, Western academic disciplines and um, uh, th this, we are not poor right? We have been robbed. So we must not move around with that thing, Yoguti. We are the most unequal country in the world and our society. We are not poor. We have been robbed. AIist was executed against us. So we must not fall into that trap, the flimsy and false academic debate, because once we accept that thing, right, the models we are going to adopt to solve the problem will be based on a false diagnosis that we are an unequal. We are not an unequal society because the people, Abani, Nibomshaba, the land and the resources were taken from that. That's the thing we must address. You see, in my view. Then one of the last points to just make yes, before I go to the last one is then you also have, you know, the fact that um, the advent of the coronavirus and the lockdown also made it crystal clear that black people sunk deeper and deeper into poverty as a result of the lockdown and the, the coronavirus, you know. And uh, it was not surprising that it was black people again. You saw black people all over the country, especially during the first month of the lockdown, queuing for food. You know, uh, you know the food, the food parcel trauma and humiliation. Black people were queuing for food. There was this other picture, I think, Yala Centurion, which was doing the rounds where the thing was snaking like nobody's business. The queue, right? So the lockdown just confirmed to us what we knew. You know that uh, black people, you know, are the poor and they are living in poverty, and their poverty has become even worse now. The lockdown just uh, made that even more crystal clear. Now, um, the other two things I want to say just before we step off this thing and we go into the last point is then you also have the other phenomenon, even that was before the lockdown, of Black children who die in pit toilets, pit latrine toilets. You see? Yeah. I can't imagine, Baget, anything more dehumanizing than that. I can't imagine anything more dehumanizing than that. But here's the biggest tragedy. What happens in South Africa when that happens to a black child? Does South Africa go into a shutdown? Does the country come to a standstill? Does it affect the economy or the rent? It doesn't. 
These children are younger than me and you because many of them are like five because they are primary school kids, you know, primary school kids. These are the children who allegedly are born into freedom. And they go and die in pit latrine toilets. I can't imagine what a five-year-old, you know, like Michael um, Kampo or Lum Kamketwa from the Eastern Cape, you know, five and eight-year-old, you know, to die in that manner. I can't imagine, you know. Now, that is our reality. And you have Black people who don't want us to talk about that because they are worried about their jobs and their tenders. And they don't want to offend the people who give them their jobs and their tenders. So, and we must not talk about the black children who learn under trees. We must not talk about the black children who die in pit latrines. We must not talk about the fact that it is our people who must be food parcel dependent in a country as rich as this one. So there are black people who have been co-opted and who have bought into the system, who are benefiting from the system financially, who get offended when we talk about these things and take issue with us when we talk about, because they are financially benefiting from the system. Bonabak rent, you know, and so me, you and others, when we talk like that, we offend them, right? Um, now, the last point on this one is that then there's another thing that they also don't want us to talk about. We talk about police brutality in other parts of the world, right? But police continue to kill Black people in South Africa disproportionately to other racial groups. Police continue to do that, you know? And even before Imarikan, you know, uh, Remember they killed Andris Tatane. That's before Marikana, broad daylight. Andris Tatane was not armed, right? Abam Shayang, Abam Tini, they shot at him. He was not armed. After Andris Tatane, they killed a young girl, 17 year old. I never forget her story. Nobile and Zuza, in an area in KZN called Ikata, Ikata Meno, you know? Uh, she was shot in the back of the head when she was running away by the police. Black police shot her just before Imarikana. We know what happened in Imarikana. Then after that, um, in an area called Mututlung, to the north of Pretoria, um, Black people were protesting for water in 2014. You know, Mike Tele, Osaya Raube, um, I forget the other names, were killed by the police. They were protesting for water. In January of that same year, a young man in his 20s in the Tswane CBD, uh, John Rivombo, the Metro police were harassing them as uh, street vendors as they are called. Now, because they were protesting, he got shot and killed. At the time he had his son was three months years, three months old, 20 year old, John Rivo. You'll never hear of him. And I'll tell you why. Um, then you have Sbusiso Amos. I'm sure you've never heard of Sbusiso Amos. Sbusiso Amos is one of the first black people to be killed by the police during the lockdown or March. He out here said first Luras. Why don't we know? Why is the media not talking about it? Pietras Miggles, Aden Emmanuel, Robin Munzumi. Robin Munzumi is a black lady who was killed uh, in April this year. She was found hanging from her cell. The police claim she committed suicide. You know of the story of Collins Corsa, you know, was uh, uh, Alex, right? Then you also know about the story of the 16 year old boy from El Dorado Park, Nathaniel Julius, who had Down syndrome. Nathaniel Julius went out to go and buy biscuits. He was not armed. Nathaniel Julius was shot, killed, and they tried to hide the evidence still. Now, Nathaniel Julius was killed in August this year 
I'm not talking any, August this year, 16 year old black boy with Down syndrome. Now, my point is during the lockdown, remember yeah, the president took time to mention the names of the women who were killed as part of GBV. I don't know if some of you remember, majority of them were black women, you know, I have no issue with that, you know, that he highlighted it, especially where our own people are involved. I'm happy when our leaders highlight that. But here's my problem. As a black man, the people that the police kill the most statistically in this country are black men, statistically. If you looked at the videos that were on social media of the people that the, the soldiers were humiliating and making them roll in the ground. What, did you see any video of black women or any woman being done that? I'm not saying they didn't do it, but the overwhelming videos that we saw of this, the, the army, they were humiliating black men. And that is the same attitude of the police that in the way that they deal with black men, they are very vicious, you know, which is not different from the situation in the US. Now, the problem with that is that the killing of black men by the police, right, is underreported and does not become an issue. But the mother of all ironies, both the minister of police and the president made mention of the murder of George Floyd in the US. But they said nothing about the murder of black men by the police, including Collins Corsa. Did the president ever mention Collins Corsa? Yeah, in the manner that they mentioned George Floyd, you know, the president was scathing on George Floyd, on, on Donald Trump, you know, uh, and how they were dealing with it. So this is the other problem, you know, that, that is happening in this country, you know, that, um, so when we talk police brutality, like we are going to do when we conclude, uh, police brutality is endemic in South Africa and police brutality uh, is 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 anti-black, you know. The police are brutal with black people generally, but in particular black men. But here's the deeper thing: it is black men who are police who are brutal with other black men. You must also understand that dynamic, and this is not surprising because when you also look at the murder rate. The, according to South African police services, right, people are killed at the rate of um, 20 per day in South Africa. You know, about 20 people get killed uh, per day. Um, the majority of those get, who are killed are men and black men, and the majority of the people who kill them are other black men. You know, now the people who were killed in Marikana were our black men. Who killed them? Black men, you know. So it's another area we should focus on about that. And my argument is the gender-based violence discourse is not penetrating when it comes to understanding the phenomenon of violence in the black community as a totality, because violence is not just gendered and it's not just directed towards women, you know. The nature of violence in the black community is structural, you know, and the reason why it is structural, uh, it has to do with the structural conditions of violence in the black community. So don't just reduce violence to interpersonal contact, you know, poverty is violence, deprivation is violence, uh, lack of, those are all forms of violence, you know, that produce the interpersonal violence because people are incubated in red-like conditions. Now, if you grow up in red-like conditions, you are going to have this type of behavior because this is the type of conditions where black men are incubated in, you know? So it's not surprising that you see the type of vicious things that black men do to each other and in particular, the things that they do to black women. It's because you must understand the structural conditions under which these black men are socialized, you know? Because if you don't deal with the structural conditions, how are you going to deal with behavioral and attitudinal things? 
root cause analysis. Now, lastly, uh, as it relates to what is happening in Nigeria, you know, uh, I had written a reflection in 2019 about what I was seeing, you know, that, uh, and I just use the formulation police brutality for purposes of discourse, but I think there are deeper issues happening and police brutality is just a manifestation. Um, if you look, for instance, all over the world now, as we speak, there are uprisings. You know, you look at Lebanon, you look at Sudan, you look at Tunisia, uh, you look at Egypt, you know, you look at Zimbabwe, you know, there are uprisings. You look at um, uh, Belarus, you know, you look at what happened in um, Chile recently. Now, if you look at all of those things, you know, uh, even in Hong Kong, remember recently, is that some of the dimensions you see is that it is mainly young people who are standing up in those countries. One. Two, many of them are calling for their governments or the leader of the governments to step down. Those are the things that they have in common. Uh, one of the reactions you have seen or the dominant reactions is that you often see the police and the army being unleashed on these young people. Before it happened in um, Nigeria, as is happening now with um, SARS, the same thing happened in Sudan under Omar al-Bashir, you know, until he was deposed. Remember, the same thing happened in Egypt under Hosni, Hosni Mubarak, you know. The same thing happened in um, Algeria under Bouteflika. The same thing is happening now in Lebanon as we speak, you know. So I seem to think that what is happening is that there is a, a generation in those countries, you know, which is not like their parents, they have decided that the same thing in Uganda under Museveni now, you know, they have decided that they are not going to continue to allow themselves to be brutalized in this manner. And they are going to stand up. That's why you see it's mainly young people, people in their 20s and 30s who are rising up. So there's a demographic or a generational aspect to it as well. That there are people who are saying they are no longer going to accept the system the way it is. You know, the same argument can be made about the fees must fall uprising. Remember how it started. It started with the action of a young man at UCT called uh, Kumani Makrel, the one who stood and protested at the stage Uka roads, if you remember. And that thing sparked protest in other campuses and then led towards fees must fall, but initially started as roads must fall, right? It was even in the US, I know even in England, in Oxford, uh, but you also saw with the Black Lives Matter protest recently with George Floyd, what happened is that there's another dimension it took, especially when it went to the UK. The statues of the people who were involved in slavery were demolished by the people who were protesting against police brutality in the UK, you know. So you see this happening. Then there's another thing we must pay attention to, and it's gonna happen in South Africa as well. The threat that these young people are posing in countries like Sudan, Iran, uh, not Iran, Libya, uh, um, Lebanon, another, one of the reactions, it has happened in Zimbabwe and Amnangagwa. They cut off the internet. This is one of the things they do because uh, the uh, hashtag of, of what is happening now in Nigeria, right? Uh, and SARS started on social media. That's why it's a hashtag, you know? So if you disable social media, you disable the capacity of today's young people to organize. Many governments have noticed this thing. And if a similar situation or atmosphere should present itself in South Africa, I think they are going to do the same thing. Already now, you see what Facebook is doing. When you speak black truth on Facebook, you know, uh, uh, I, now there is a new thing now. You see, each generation Yeyamanje is that when your fathers and your mothers tell you, Bona, they went to Robben Island, they've got struggles, credentials. Manje Nina Nibachelu Guti, you went to Facebook jail. You know, you also have struggle credentials. I was in jail, I went to Facebook jail. You don't say Square or Sam Lab, a Facebook jail. You know, you now have Facebook jail. But my point is, 
a lot of times black people go to Facebook jail because they post pro-black content. Yeah, well. And we shouldn't be complaining. Facebook is white owned. It's not our platform. We decided to go and put ourselves on. We must create our own platform so that we can say our things. So it doesn't help us to complain about uh, Facebook being racist or anti-black. They should be racist and anti-black. They are white, it's fine. in Doya. They are not acting out of character. We should be thinking of having our own platforms and stop complaining about Facebook jail. You know, we must create our own platforms. So, but this is part and parcel of the strategy, say repression. We would not have known because even if you look at how the mainstream media in South Africa is reporting on what is happening in Nigeria, they are not reporting that story as you would like to, you know. We have to rely on social media and our brothers and sisters uh, from Nigeria who we are involved with Maboku social media. They give us the, uh, the, the background. Now, my view is that what is happening in Nigeria is, a, is, is sparked by a combination of factors. The first one is I often make the point, and Abanyabant I know about Tandilent because they talk about patriotism, you know? I don't know how slaves can be patriotic to what. Um, all the, what we call African states today are a product of the Berlin Conference of uh, 1884 and 1885, right? The model that we have of what is called a state today comes from a Berlin Conference. In Nigeria, um, is, is amongst others, part of it, you know, British and French colony, you know, the British and the French fought over in Nigeria. Yeah, well, now in Nigeria, like many of the other African countries have got a colonial history. Uh, there's also now a strong move by the Arabs, you know, through Boko Haram to infiltrate into Nigeria and capture the Arab sections of Nigeria and probably turn them into some kind of a small Arab state. Because remember, the Northern part of Africa, which is called the Maghreb has been captured by the Arabs, you know, uh, and through organizations like Abu uh, ISIS, you know, Boko Aram is giving ISIS hope that they can turn Nigeria or parts of Nigeria into a Muslim state. And they, then they do things like Abu Sharia law, as they say, the fights that we are seeing now happening in, um, Libya, not Libya, in Mali. Now, Nigeria has got that complex and complicated history, you know, that you must understand. And the other problem here is not so much also police brutality. This unit, SARS, was formed in 1992 to deal with uh, violent crime and especially armed violence. But what has happened over time SARS has become an organization that terrorizes ordinary people in, the, in, in, um, in, in Nigeria. It has been involved in kidnappings. It has been implicated in money laundering, in corruption, and all sorts of things. That's why they are saying, they are not saying reform it. They are saying end it, because it has, it has caused the people of Nigeria untold terror. You know, But the bigger issue here is that what is happening in Nigeria is no different from what the government of Zimbabwe did against its own people when they unleashed the police on them, right? Uh, it is no different from what the government of uh, Museveni did in Uganda, what um, Omar al-Bashir did in Sudan, you know? So my point is that thing you spoke about here, neo-colonialism, you know, is still at play where these people that we call African leaders are puppets of either the Arabs or the Chinese or the Europeans and the Americans. And as part of showing their commitment to their puppet masters, they become very brutal and they become very ruthless, especially to African young people. But in the case of Nigeria, with the SARS thing, there's another disturbing phenomenon in what is happening in Nigeria. Uh, somebody, like these rogue units, because these Richard Mzuli type people, you know, uh, some of the people in the intelligence in Nigeria are organizing young people in Nigeria to brutalize the other young people who are protesting. 
So there is a group of young people in Nigeria who are being transported in the areas where there are protests to brutalize these others, you know? And many of them, if you look at it from the footage that I've seen, I've, I've looked at a couple of videos. Many of them, you can see these are young people who are economically destitute and they are being exploited by the elite in Nigeria to suppress, because you see, my suspicion is the elite in Nigeria are realizing their time is up and that if they allow this protest to continue, right, this protest is going to spark a bigger movement, which might ever even lead to the collapse of the government, not just the collapse of that police unit. Because there are other problems in Nigeria, you know, of the corruption, of uh, the economic opportunities. And the, the fear of the elite, in my view, is that if they allow this protest against SARS to to grow, it's going to spark a bigger revolution and the ultimate overthrow of the current government. You know, uh, to conclude, Bagit, um, I think what we must do, like Kundlondlo has said, is that um, we must realize the state and the condition we are in as Africans globally. We are under attack, you know, uh, in a number of ways. And in addition to being under attacked, we are not organized as black people in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Nigeria. We are not organized, you know, and because we are not organized, it is very easy for the puppets in the African continent who run our countries on behalf of the plutocrats, you know, it is very easy for them to do as they wish, you know, the looting that they're doing, the money that leaves the continent. Look what is happening in the DRC, you know? The over 6 million of our people uh, have been killed in the DRC, you know? What is the role of bodies like the African Union? You understand? So there are serious questions we should be asking ourselves as Africans of our generation about the state of our continent not just what is happening in Nigeria and what we should be doing, you know, and one of the things I think we should do is that we should make an effort to link up with other Africans uh, on the continent, you know, and have a cross pollination of ideas on what we should be doing to understand better what is at play here. So that when we develop responses, those responses are informed by a concrete understanding of what is really happening. So. What I'm really calling for is for us to build a continental movement, you know, of Africans of our generation, because our problems are similar. If you look at what is happening in our various countries, the problems are by and large similar. And my view is that the most logical thing for us to do is to build a Pan-African movement of some sort outside the political parties that we have, because the political parties in my view are part of the problem, that we build an independent Pan-Africanist movement of, um, I don't want to say African young people, uh, but youngish, let me say youngish, uh, youngish African people, you know, with fresher ideas who would come with a different vision and who would do different things. I think there's a lot we can do, you know, uh, if we bring our skills, our resources, and our ideas together, and we can give our continent and ourselves uh, hope, you know. And I want to argue, we must not think about ourselves, we must think about the next generation of Africans, and we must do that for them, you know. Uh, so I'm calling for us to have a Pan-Africanist dialogue so that we can work towards a Pan-Africanist movement um, and we will later include even our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, in the US, and in other parts of the Black world, you know, because our biggest problem is that we are not organized and we are not connected, you know, and that is in my view what we should work for. There's resources out there that we can mobilize, but our problem, we don't have a movement and we react to things um, in a sporadic way, you see. If something happens again in another African country, we are going to start another hashtag, you know, and it's gonna fizzle out. So my problem is with us not being organized and not understanding that we need to build a movement that constantly organizes, that constantly resists, that constantly 
um, agitates for change, you know, that it, it should be continuous, continuous. So I'm calling for us to build a movement, essentially. Uh, let's see if we can't convene a meeting of like-minded Black people very soon to talk about our problems and design a program to respond to some of the issues um, that myself and Unlonzo have shared here. Togozani. Uh, Aluta, 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 continua. Uh, some things I couldn't agree more with you. Um, we need to be organized. We need to organize ourselves. Um, hey, some things you are a schoolman. Uh, you are an entire library walking. Uh, we, <laughs> we, I've, I've, I've learned so much uh, from tonight's lecture. I think I think more than being a lecturer of tonight's uh, lecture, uh, I, I did more learning, and I appreciate you uh, in that regard. Uh, family, I'm aware that you all uh, gonna want this recording uh, because you know this is something you have to watch and watch and watch again and pause and take notes and that kind of thing. So we will make it readily available for everyone. It's currently being streamed on Facebook. So if you need it urgently, you can easily go to Arise Black Child on Facebook, or you can go to my personal uh, profile, Sandile Prince in CV, you, you, you should find it there. But what I'll do is I will save it and I will then post it on YouTube, but that can only happen on Monday. Uh, so we will make um, these available. This includes Eara Thomas Sankara that we had about a week ago. It will also be posted on YouTube uh, for you guys to always go back to and reference. Uh, I don't want to keep us any longer. Uh, we yeah. have um, <laughs> some PC is a moving train, uh, but I, I want to assure you some PC the Singapore Regang, we were listening attentively and we, we didn't even feel is I'm, I'm actually I'm shocked happy. now looking at the time. Uh, but mm. thank you then to everyone as well. O -o uh, let me hear people's voices, actually. Uh, uh, we tend to speak on our own. Yeah, uh, man, true. This is where uh, EP, number one, number two, and I see Mbal has been listening very attentively, shaking, nodding. Yes. Uh, you know, I've been watching her facial expressions. Thank yeah. you so much for pulling through. Uh, as means of just Coming out, uh, can I hear everyone? Sipindegai three, city aluta, continua, aluta, continua, aluta, continua. <laughs> At the count of, uh, I'm waiting for everyone to unmute themselves. <laughs> uh, Alfu, Alfu, uh, don't you want to give them a chance if there's anybody who wants to say something? As check Absolutely, before, absolutely. Before City Aluta continue, I'm something Yes, as now if if there's anyone, a lot has been said here. So if you want to make a, a remark, a reflection of some sort, please feel free to to say something. Okay. So Mina Mumbali, I'm guessing most people can or hear me yeah I can hear you um i'm at all i i don't want to lie i'm at all it is just i feel like i i don't know myself i and i'm just starting to know um who i am before i even know who we all are and Nyabonga, you know, Nyabonga Sambisi, Nyabonga Sibi, it's just been, it's, yeah. I can't believe I got in late and I missed last week, but that is never going to happen again. So Nyabonga could. So basically, you see, Uti, this is a call for us to not stop. People are saying they will not miss the next one. <laughs> so we need 
need to keep this train moving. Uh, mm. Sis Nigi, I can see your hand is raised. Yeah, feel free to to unmute and 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 make your comments as well. Hey, greetings. Um, okay, I, I just wanted to 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 ask maybe some few questions uh, regarding uh, Samora Michelle. I think at the time I was uh, growing up, well, I didn't really participate much into these things because I started voting in, was it 2003? I don't remember. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the funny thing is that even at the time they were talking about elections, I was very young by then, I think I was 10. So I didn't even know what uh, elections were. I was thinking of this big war that is coming. <laughs> so, um, but I grew up in a in a PAC environment because my father was upoko and uh, always talking about land first, all shall follow. Uh, I think that is the environment I grew up in, the agricultural space and valuing the land of our ancestors. Amazing. Then I heard the, the songs about the release of Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Kululu Mandela, Zospata, and all those things. And uh, I think at some point, the, the name of Samora Michelle came. Uh, I was not even aware of Grasha and all that, because there's a time when we thought that Mandela got married to a white woman, you know? And they even said that <laughs> they even said that Mandela has got a baby, you know, from a white woman. So uh, I mean, I'm not sure if maybe that was Grasha. People just thought that maybe Grasha Marshall was a a white woman or what. But um, just after 1994, Mandela was very close to the white people, I must say, and it it was actually noticeable even to the rural people like me who did not get much of the exposure to the media. But I just wanted to know what really influenced uh, Grasha Marshall to, to get married to Nelson Mandela. Because I hear that, uh, I hear that one of the things that uh, Samora Marshall stood for, uh, like it's like, he dared the, 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 the white people to say, you dare kill Mandela, you know? And there is this thing that says, oh, Mandela at the time, uh, yes, Wabanjo, but Amapulu or whoever that was fighting during that time, Bebe Yazu, Uti, should Mandela Ngabu Yetele, you know? I think maybe there would be war of some sort, you know? And uh, Usamora, I think it's one of the people about he, if Njebalinga, Ugutibamula Lumandela, you know? So I'm not sure if this also influenced the return of Mandela and also influenced the, the, the killing of Samora Michelle. And maybe uh, they knew that uh, if Samora lived, Mandela it got released. Maybe um, Mandela might be influenced otherwise not to actually agree on what he had agreed upon okay. during the negotiations. And maybe um, they, they won't actually succeed in whatever that they wanted to do. And now there is this thing that Unabantu Baga Mandela before prison, not Mandela after. You know, so then there is all this. Uh, I'm not sure if I will say it's concern, these theories, conspiracy, <laughs> conspiracy theories. Yes, mm. that uh, Mandela actually did not return. You know, uh, so I don't know. Maybe if we'll have time to actually do a lot of research on that, as we 
uh, in the space of telling the, the truth and the history as it is. Ubutu, why is there so much that is said about Umandela uh, after prison that people suspect that maybe he was not the Mandela that came out yeah. of the prison? Okay. And uh, why is it that people are saying they are for the Mandela that went to prison, not the one that returned? And looking at the, the separation of Mandela and Winnie and the hatred that a lot of people had uh, for Winnie and Mandela getting married to Samora Marshall's wife, who was also killed mysteriously. Sure. And uh, um, okay, calling in the what else do I want to mention? <laughs> okay, yeah, but um, I'm just, you know, um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of maybe have a contribution on that, even if the answers are not going to be made now, but okay. maybe we could, as we, we move on, try to bring also such to the public, because I hear, I, I hear a lot of things, you know, about uh, Mandela, and then we know that there was this book that even Krasha wanted recalled, from from the from the bookshelves, you know that she didn't want it to be released. We still don't know what was in that book, you know, and we don't know if Mandela was happy to see Winnie in the hospital before he died, uh, and then maybe Krasha did not like that. So uh, we we don't know, you know. There's just so much, and I hope that we'll just unpack such things in the near future. Thank you. Do we still have people there? Eh? There's nine of us left here. Okay. So I think let's just let who I think Leroy, Leroy you want to say something? Well, uh, mine is very simple. Um, it's uh, an appreciation. Uh, more than anything. Uh, we've went to, uh, through two lectures, is the second one, and I've been listening very attentively. And um, I like to say, Mr. Sompisi knows I have the opportunity of <laughs> spending my days with him. Uh, it is one of the most inspirational things that had happened to my life. And I don't take this uh, thing for granted. And I think um, you, you guys don't know the impact you have on people's lives. And I think uh, we must be very conscious about that, that uh, the lectures that you do, the messages that you bring, they really uplift and enlighten young African men such as me. I'm not at your guys' age group. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Sompisi I, I don't uh, know. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we are I'm a young that. fella, but um, um, <laughs> I'm a young fella, but uh, I'm learning a lot. Yeah, so. And mine is to say that, guys, uh, please uh, do not stop this. It's not about the number of people who get onto the platform. Uh, it could be two people, but those two people. You don't know how many other people they will affect. And uh, uh, in marketing, I'm a, a student of marketing. Uh, word of mouth is the best way of marketing. So when you can touch a person, it is a very important thing that uh, is not about the number of people you touch. But if you can touch one person, you don't know what the impact of the other person is and I, I would just really love to say that guys uh, I appreciate this uh, I love this and uh, <laughs> I, I mean Aluta continue and you know it's good to put substance behind the words that you talk uh, people like to say Aluta continue but what does Aluta continue for or for who you know and uh, people like you, uh, Mr. Sompisi, put substance behind uh, those words that we speak. So uh, mine, like I said, is uh, I can't and 
uh, we really appreciate this. And I really want to encourage you guys that let's not stop. And uh, I, I will be a foot soldier if you need what <laughs> to push this mission. And definitely you have my commitment in this mission. And I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Aluta, I can see le, I can see le poti amena, can see lengof. Um, wow, I think I think uh, we appreciate that feedback. It means a lot um, to get feedback. You know, it's always good to know what lowest wins are you. Kono gugwenza yo na no ma we just you mm. know wasting time talking. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we appreciate that feedback a lot, and I think you are placing a. A burden of honor and an honor of a burden. Pez guam no something. To not stop, but to to continue. So yeah. we will. I will I will take discussion with him, and we will frame a way of how we can continue with these sessions. Yeah. Bagiti um, gusep sugu. Yeah. I, I yeah. Yeah, George. I, I just wanted to say. That thing about Mandela is a long discussion. I anticipated it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to recommend a couple of books to show you how difficult this thing is about Mandela. You know? Because it needs us to go and study. And uh, the first one is Tomorrow is Another Country by Elister Sparks. Tomorrow is another country. Um, one of the things that this book talks about, it talks about the negotiations that happened while Bob Mandela was in jail. Mm. You know, Tomorrow is another country by Elister Sparks. Um, then you have Secret Revolution. And you see he's on the picture there. Um, the author yelling out to Secret Revolution was the head of the intelligence of the apartheid government. His assignment was to get Ubabu Mandela to agree to the negotiations while Ubabu Mandela was in jail. He facilitated the meeting between Ubabu Mandela and P.W. Port. The detail is in here. Then when he got to Ubabu Mandela, he then worked on a project to get the ANC on board. He explains in the second book how he got the ANC after he got to Bob Mandela in the first book, in Peaceful Revolution. Then there is the role that the British played behind the scenes through the South African government, which is explained in this book by Robin Ronwick, the one who invited the EFF to London recently. Lord, he's called Lord Renwick. You know? uh, he explains uh, what their role was and how Abu Baba Mandela changed what they said and what influenced those sort of things. So uh, I will share these books because the, the list is there on the presentation. I will make them available and then we'll see. Um, it will help our discussion on Ubabu Mandela and his role in the ANC because it's a very deep thing and it's very complicated, you know. And I don't want us to just be emotional about it. I want us to look at uh, the story, the detail, and the information to understand and not to be just a conspiracy because there are books. I've just shared four, but there are many others, you know, uh, that speak to this powerful man's role and very confusing role, you know, that this man is admired, but um, as much as he's admired, we can't understand why we are suffering like this and we have such a powerful man. Thank you, Thank you. At the count of three, we all say Aluta Continua three times. Are you all okay with that family? Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> yes. One, two, three. Aluta continue. Aluta continue.
Hallo, Luther. 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 Family, the struggle continues. Absolutely. Always. Mm -hmm. Next evening. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I can, I can. Can you mambo? Give me tell you to lay. Those who want to, those who want to stay can stay. It's fine. Uh, yeah, there is um, there is a song that I like that Dubabu Samora Michelle sang. Um, when they were rehabilitating some of the people who sold out Ifrelim, you know. Mm -hmm. Um Kani Mambo, Kani Mambo, Kani Mambo, Kani Mambo, Frelimbo, Ekani Mambo, Kani Mambo, Frelimbo, Ekani Mambo, Kani Mambo, Frelimbo, Kani Mambo, Frelimbo, Nia Kenza, Nia Kenza, Nia Kenza, Frelimbo, Nia Obrigado, 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 Frelimo, obrigado, obrigado, Frelimo, obrigado. Obrigado, Frelimo. Obrigado, Frelimo. Aluta. Continua. Continua. Aluta. Aluta. Continua. Cane mambo. Aluta. So at the physical at the physical meeting we will be singing properly. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so Actually, this song sounds like le le sound. I see you, And as in it's like Tina I understand the city. You know, I go to a It was actually not. It was a yeah. That you are so I must get it yeah. right because yeah. I actually never understood the song until now. Because in your years, oh, I share, oh, I share your whole. But I'm like, hey, yeah, it's still lingo. So I you're going to see you always have these songs with messages. But sometimes you find that, oh, yes, no, but it's a Kalimapo or it's a Kalimapo or it's a you know, and but. But like like on music we always had his songs that like uh Escoloni that were sort of having that message. Yeah. Uh, even oh. with him choral, le les is a competition. I remember this uh -huh. these songs. Cause I'm a mama ningi bengwa vala po mina about Tokyo si huale inwele in to because that that song that inwele it in gives a bafana beti ba ya maz we will do that, yeah. So it's, it talks about all this, you know, yeah. this, uh, oh, Tokyo, so while um, yama, we are mas, yama. We are young, since we are Malta, who spoke of a parliament, who holy salsa in Wale. So, those songs, sometimes I go to YouTube because it requires a manja as such to less of a man. A septula, Amazon, I actually, I actually used to listen to what him is really, but it's young for a manja, septula, and Gomazo, Pusanova, as a Nazi, son, you know, there's too much remixing. Because Gona Lango Malay, I see. Is all a talk was a big pala licazi, Sibula Wangama, and less that. 
Oh, yeah. So Let's 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 leave them for the physical meeting. Who's <laughs> on 